I'm Ivan Robertson, along with Carrie. I'm the co-founder of Robertson Cooper. Um, one of the things that strikes me about well-being is that looking at it from, well, about life in general, actually, is that looking at things from different perspectives uh, can often be very helpful and informative. And I think, in some ways, that's what this next session is about. We've got two people looking at it from very different perspectives, but both knowledgeable and committed. Um, and both of them are going to talk for 10 to 15 minutes. If there is any time at the end, we'll take questions. Uh, the two speakers are David Lammy and Professor Paul Dolan. Um, I'll introduce them one at a time, I think, uh, so there'll be a, a gap between when Paul's going to speak first. Uh, rather, David's going to speak first. Um, you, you've got a, a briefing note on both of them, but, but may I just mention that um, David was an MP at uh, 27, I think, which seems to be a remarkably young age, a minister in the Labour government for, for nine years. And I think the primary reason for him being here right now is that he chairs the all-party uh, group that's looking at happiness and so on, well-being from a, an economics point of view. So let me hand over now to uh, David Lammy. Well, I haven't said anything yet, and I'm certainly not 27 anymore. My God, you know, I started in politics now 14 years ago, and in those days I looked a bit more like Denzel Washington. Now I think I look like Forrest Whitaker. So things um, have, certainly, have certainly changed, and, you know, I've seen the cycles uh, go alongside this. But I suppose if you're chairing the all-party group on well-being, it's a cross-party group pushing the well-being agenda, um, in Westminster and amongst opinion formers, it's important to say that I'm not just standing here as a member of Parliament. I'm standing here as a father of three children. Uh, I have um, I've got my youngest is um, seven months old, and she just started sleeping through the night last night. <laughs> and that's a big deal. Uh, that is the most important thing going on in my life uh, at, at the moment. And I also, in that period in office, uh, had to deal with the loss of both my parents, uh, my mother fighting a battle against ovarian cancer uh, just before the 2010 election. So, it, you know, when we're discussing well-being, what we're doing, I think, is forcing policymakers and those in positions of power, whether they're heading a corporation, human resources, or indeed making policy in Westminster or at City Hall or in local government, to actually understand that there are real people behind this story. I, I just want to start by saying um, whatever uh, you read in the newspapers, however you feel about Nigel Farage, Ed Miliband is currency at the moment, uh, but it will move on to David Cameron, the swings and uh, ebbs of politics. Um, there are two massive things going on in our developed society in Britain um, and in most developed economies in the world. Uh, and they're the things that bring tremendous challenges for mainstream politics at the moment. And it happens to be why I think that the well-being agenda is so important. These two revolutions that have happened in the lifetime of everyone in this room, looking at the age profile, um, are the first was the social liberal revolution of the 1960s, and the second was the economic liberal revolution of the 1980s. And all of us in this room are living with the consequence of those two quiet revolutions. We take all of it for granted, but it all has repercussions. Now, the first revolution of the 1960s, well, it's certainly the revolution that we would associate at its best with people like Martin Luther King, Mandela, Gandhi, 
rights for black and ethnic minorities across the world. It's a revolution I think we would associate also with women, women coming into the Labour Party, taking control of their own bodies with the birth of the pill uh, in the 1960s. Um, at its best, it's what gives us a very strong rights consciousness. But at its worst, if we're just aware of our rights and not of our responsibilities, we're in trouble. And there's something by the time we get to 2014 that connects the banker that thinks it's his right to have that three million bonus to the MP that thinks it's his right to have that duck house on taxpayers' money to the young man in my constituency that smashes into Foot Locker on the first day of those riots in 2011 because it's my right to that pair of trainers. It's actually an individualism that means it's far harder for us to come back together as a collective, as a society, as a family. The rights of women and the rights of children, which is also important in our age, should never eclipse in the end the family unit and how they coexist together. It's why I have always in politics had a lot to say about the importance of fatherhood, because even though relationships can break down or even not get started, I don't want to lose for the 65% of my constituents who don't have a father figure present, the idea that actually, if you're old enough to give birth and have a child, you probably ought to stay there along the journey. So the second revolution, the economic liberal revolution, another liberal, very important to remember the liberal. Basically, by the time of the crash, the idea that you can make money however you want with very little regulation. Well, I hope I don't have to explain where that has got us to in 2014. It is not to say that you don't accept the upsides, of course, um, of a uh, more material uh, uh, society in which people are productive and make things. But it is to say that we have a housing crisis present in London. Um, you know, when the average wage here in this city is £36,000 and the average cost of a house is £420, £20,000, <laughs> do the maths. Real challenge um, at the moment. In fact, the average age of those buying a house in London last year was 39. And on the current trajectory, the average age in a generation will be 52. So I don't know any of you who've got children. I would be very, very worried. How does this then affect well-being? Well, if we've got these two drivers coming together, this social liberal revolution and this economic liberal revolution, in fact, there's a place in which the Guardian meets the Times and we have this hyped up individualism and somewhere in the mix, the well-being of our communities gets lost. And what then happens is other elements creep in. So off stage comes Nigel Farage. Off stage comes Russell Brand talking about a different kind of well-being and a different kind of solution. One suggesting that anarchy and revolution is the way forward, the other saying that don't worry about your well-being, the way to fix your well-being is to get rid of those immigrants and pull out of Europe. So these are really important times and what my all-party group has sought to do is to say that, is to support that idea and to give him credit David Cameron um, uh, adopted the idea, certainly in opposition, 
and in government has been keen to move forward with the measurement and the data on a yearly basis of our well-being and our happiness. But the bottom line is to say that it is not just about our GDP. There is more to life than just our productivity. Um, let us actually talk about our mental health. Let us actually talk about, and particularly actually, the mental health of our young, young children. That is why um, I was very keen to accept a challenge by The Guardian to spend a week stepping back slightly from politics and looking at my well-being. They looked at my diet and asked me why I had turned into Forrest Whitaker. Uh, we found that I wasn't drinking enough water. We found that, that, that you know, I, I, I'm in the business of delivering speeches and, you know, I live about three or four a day. Um, and, you know, one of the things you do um, is that you, I, I, I do a lot of running. I don't run to music. I run often to sort of podcasts and ideas and views and all the rest of it. Um, so they were very keen to get me doing mindfulness. Just stopping for a bit. Just 10 minutes, David. And just focusing and zoning back in on the self. It was phenomenally helpful to do that. But then when we conducted our inquiry and spoke to the mindfulness experts, what was clear was actually these techniques are important in health. We want our doctors prescribing mindfulness. And guess what? If we've got the Treasury leaning up against us, it saves money to help people to stop and to reflect and in an old-fashioned sense meditate. And guess what? The teachers then said, what about a bit of mindfulness? Because we're teaching in schools that are very diverse, lots of things coming into the class in the morning, and we want techniques with how to help those children to refocus and recommit in that moment in the classroom. We also found that the well-being agenda, obviously hugely important in health, and with prescription bills rising, with our population aging, um, we do need to take seriously the world of alternative medicine, but also finding ways to encourage, if you like, that well-being agenda in the most holistic of fashions. But we were keen also to revisit why we have a planning system. We, in politics, across parties are talking about the need to build housing again. But actually, it's really important that we say we're not talking about the need to build another generation of tower block housing estates that don't work and don't function. We don't just want to build housing, we need to build spaces that people want to live in. You have to design in green spaces. You have to design in arts and culture. You're actually building communities, not just housing. That's why, actually, we have a planning system. I was, like a lot of you, I was in Tower Hill the other day looking at that wonderful exhibition of um, ceramic poppies. I have to say, as I came out of London Bridge and walked round between the tall buildings and the... Sh it felt very higgledy-piggledy. It didn't feel like someone had really thought about the space around this historic part of London. So that's the potential politically of the well-being agenda. And clearly, in the sense of the employment sphere, we have more to do and to attend to. Our country is now measuring well-being. It's now measuring happiness. The debate is moving on so we can understand the economic value, both in relation to productivity and GDP, but also because this agenda saves money. In the end, in terms of hours spent at work, 
compared to hours off sick. In terms of establishing a corporate identity and people belonging and feeling, when you look at the better employees, they may not label it well, well-being, but what John Lewis, for example, has been up to has been the well-being agenda for many, many years. So this is really important stuff. Uh, I'm very pleased to be pushing this in Parliament, but I hope because of the broader themes that are happening in politics that I'm pushing at an open door. I happen to believe, unless we take this agenda increasingly seriously, we will see a more fractured politics and we will see elements more to the fringes feeling like they're representing mainstream opinion. I'll end there. Thank you. Thanks very much, David, for a very stimulating talk. Um, Paul Dolan is Professor of Behavioural Science at London School of Economics. Um, he's one of the leading behavioural scientists who have been working on the happiness and subjective well-being area for a number of years, uh, particularly on measurement issues. Um, I'm sure Paul will uh, catch your interest today in what he has to say. If you want to follow up on his work and his ideas, uh, you might like to look at his latest book, Happiness by Design, which was published in August this year. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's all you need to know is buy happiness by design and, uh, and everyone's happy. Um, there's no point making any notes about what I'm going to say because I'm just going to change it all based on what I've just heard, or at least some of it anyway. Um, <clears throat> I'll say something about those uh, headline, headline indicators, though, of national well-being, because as um, some, of, some of you may know, together with Richard Layard at LSE, we wrote those questions that the ONS are now using to uh, measure national well-being uh, for, for um, headline indicators. And if you look at those data, some of you are interested in work. This is a good day at work. I felt like I was in somewhere in Melbourne when I uh, read that. But um, the four questions, one of the most important ones that's been uh, used most widely is asking people how satisfied they are with their lives overall um, on a scale between 0 and 10. And some associations with occupation are quite interesting. You find priests are happiest, publicans are least happy. Uh, don't know what happens if you get drunk as a priest, but anyway. Um, farmers are happier than financiers. Um, these are all correlational data, of course, uh, so it's important that we don't infer anything, um, anything too causal or even meaningful from those observations. Um, but I want to raise a challenge about those questions. Um, if you think about the question overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? Well, it takes people about three seconds to answer that question, which probably means they're not actually thinking about the answer, because if you spent enough time thinking about it, it would take a long time. Um, and importantly, I think it's a construction. Most people don't routinely go around thinking about how satisfied they are with their lives overall. Much more important, I think, um, and, and you'll see this set out much more clearly in Happiness by Design. Have you heard about that, by the way? Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> is to focus much more attention directly on people's experiences. And I think that's where mental health becomes critical. Um, it's the experiences that people have day to day, moment to moment, that we should be capturing more of and that matter in the experiences, obviously, in the lives that people lead. And let me just give you a little story that distinguishes between this evaluation of life and the experience of life, on the other hand. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I was out for, out for dinner with one of our friends who, uh, she's since changed jobs by the way, uh, having read the book, but um, she was previously working for Media Land, shall we call them, and uh, she spent the whole of the evening complaining about her boss, her commute, her job, the people she worked with. Every bit of her day-to-day -day experience was miserable. And then without any hint of irony, at the end of dinner she said, of course I love working at Media Land. And I think that's that's actually not uncommon. Much of what we do is lived in stories. Much of the things that we think should make us happy are the things that we should think should make us happy, and we go about we living the lives in these kind of narratives and stories. This was a great organisation to work for. Her friends were envious of her. Her family is somewhere that she'd always wanted to work. How could she not be happy in that job? Well, actually, she wasn't. Um, and a lot of our, our job choices are based on these narratives and these kinds of stories that we tell 
about the things that we think should make us happy rather than the things that actually do. So I'm arguing that we pay much more attention to the experiences that people have day to day. Her experiences suggested that she should change her job. The story that she tells says something quite different. Um, now, most of the experience data that we've gathered in the past has been essentially around pleasure and pain. You know, adjectives of contentment, joy, anger, worry and stress. <clears throat> there is another important category of experience that I think matters, and that is purpose. And in contrast, pointlessness and, fu and futility. But importantly, I think these are captured in the experiences of our lives. And again, not in the stories that we tell. Um, we've got two kids, David. Fortunately, they both slept from a very early age because my wife was an absolute Nazi with them. Is that, is that the right term? Should I be using the term Nazi? But anyway, she was ruthless with them and, and had them on, you know, seven till seven from pretty much when they were born. Um, and uh, the experiences of purpose that I get from being a father show up in the activities that I engage in with my kids. You know, listening to the same story for the 10th time, not particularly fun, uh, but it is fulfilling. And it feels fulfilling in the experience of that activity. I think much, much less important is the story that I tell about the meaning that my life has as a father, because that's a construction again. I'm much more interested in the meaning of moments than I am in the meaning of life. Um, and we should be capturing in the experiences both pleasure and purpose. And it turns out, it turns out that when we do that, there haven't been that much work done in this, but it turns out that when we do that, um, we, we find some interesting associations. Purpose, or at least lack of purpose, um, is associated with overeating, um, alcohol use, drug use, high risk of a whole range of adverse health outcomes, and early, and early death. Uh, so uh, not just lack of pleasure, but lack of purpose. And so I think... Um, it's important at work and at home that we have a balance between activities that we find fun on the one hand and fulfilling on the other. Now, not all of us, of course, will uh, have the same uh, you know, balance between those two things. Some of us are more pleasure machines, others more purpose engines. Uh, there's quite a few purpose engines at the LSE, I can tell you. They would be, they would be a little bit happier if they had a bit of fun. Uh, there's also, of course, many people that would, be, that would be happier if they had a bit of purpose in their lives and not so much fun. So it's about finding the balance that works for you. Um, and that's a, almost like a trial and error thing for you to work out as you go through your lives and your days. Um, <clears throat> just to return to the, to the workplace for a second, though, what's absolutely critical in ensuring that people feel like they have purposeful work experiences is the timeliness of the feedback about the activities that people are engaged in. There's nothing worse than doing something at work that you feel is pointless. And actually, we really mispredict how painful and how pointless pointlessness and purposeless feels. So uh, many of you may be familiar with the experiments that Dan Ariely has been doing on Lego. Um, for those that aren't familiar with them, um, basically there's two treatment conditions. This is a very simplified um, exposition of his work. Um, you basically build a Lego model that's then put in a box. And you build another one, and it's put in a box. And you're paid for each of these models. In the alternative condition, that model is broken down in front of your eyes, and the Lego pieces are passed back to you to build the next Lego model. Now, people feel much more pointlessness and agony at seeing the fruits of their labor broken down in front of their eyes. That's not that interesting. What is interesting is that people mispredict how quickly they will feel that and how quickly they want to leave the experiment. You think that the payment for the task would be worth it, but actually the pointlessness of the experience looms much larger than you would imagine. And many of, our, many of the things that we do in life, we mispredict about the impact of those kinds of conditions on, an, on, on our experiences. Um, you know, if you think about whether a pay rise would make you happy, what you're doing is you're thinking about whether a pay rise would, would make you happy when you're thinking about how much happier you would be with a pay rise. So you're paying attention to it, and of course it's true. If you got a pay rise and spent every waking moment thinking about how great it was to have a pay rise, it would make you happier. But you quickly withdraw attention from the pay rise and start 
paying attention to your kids keeping you up at night, um, to the arguments that you're having, to pizza, to the X factor, all of which are unaffected by how much money you have. What we're not good at predicting is the attention that we pay to different activities and experiences in our uh, lives. Um, it's all about attention um, <clears throat> and the fact that we often get the, the kind of forecast of that quite wrong. Um, now use that as an example moving, because as I say, there's no, and there's no point having notes, I'll just randomly talk shit. Um, so, one, uh, as many, as, as uh, some of you might uh, know, my earlier academic life was spent trying to value states of health and illness that are now being used by uh, agencies like NICE to inform public policy decisions. And um, that was very academically uh, advancing for me. Uh, get lots of citations of the work, but I don't, I don't think it was particularly, in hindsight, particularly helpful for policy making for the following reason. We ask people questions of the kind that says, imagine you've got some problems walking about and you're going to experience that for some time. How many years of life would you give up not to have those issues? And uh, you get an answer that says uh, that people would give up about 15% of their remaining life expectancy not to have those problems walking about. As an alternative question, you say, imagine you've got anxiety or depression, um, how many years of life would you give up not to have that? And people say about the same, about 15%. So when NICE and other regulatory agencies are thinking about allocating scarce healthcare budgets, they're treating those two conditions as if they have the same impact on people's lives. Well, just think about that for a second from an adaptation and an attention point of view. Again, it's true that some problems walking about would be as bad as mental health problems if you spent all of your time thinking about them. But whilst physical functioning conditions are, of course, a problem, and I don't want to trivialise them, you quickly get used to not being able to walk about freely, insofar as there's no pain or mental health problems associated with it. In contrast, think about being anxious or depressed. You don't get used to waking up anxious or depressed. It's every bit as bad on day 365 as it is on day one, arguably worse. We're not good at predicting where our attention will be focused in our, in our experiences. What that means is that we're currently misallocating scarce healthcare resources. We're giving greater priority to physical functioning conditions than we ought to be. And we see this in the, in the amount of money spent on mental health. It's a tiny, tiny fraction, a tiny fraction of the amount of money that should be spent on it given its impact on people's experiences of life. Not the stories that they tell about their lives, but the experiences, the day-to-day, moment-to-moment, pleasures and pains, purpose and pointlessness that people feel, literally, as they go about their daily lives. Um, so I think a, a much clearer and sharper focus on experiences, of both pleasure and purpose, would lead to better workplaces and would lead to a much uh, more efficient and equitable distribution of healthcare resources. And on that note, I shall conclude. Thank you. OK, well, thanks to, for, to both speakers for stimulating different, but I think complementary in some ways, uh, talks. We've got just about five minutes, if we run five minutes over, for questions. Um, so who would like to start us off? If you show your hand and wait for the mic, please. Just briefly who you are and then what you'd like to say. Thanks, Ivan. Uh, thanks, both uh, excellent speeches. Uh, Paul, what would you say is the, uh, sorry, I'm Steve Haynes from the British Council. What would you say is the number one thing an employer could do as part of a well-being program to focus on the now, to focus on the experience? Yeah, it's a very good question. Of course, the two words that come out of my mouth in teaching is always context matters, uh, and context does matter. But generally, it's, it's very costless, um, huge impact interventions. So um, I, think, I think that little bit of feedback, the kind of gratitude, the thank you, the... Um, your work's appreciated, not in a contrived, have a nice day kind of way, right, because then that becomes annoying, um, but, but, but in a way that feels like it's genuine. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, because as, as I said before, there's so many projects are started in workplaces that get terminated or cancelled or changed for a whole host of different reasons, and the staff get demoralised by that. 
there's no feedback that actually this might not be you know, worthwhile in terms of the actual project that you've worked on, but there are other benefits that come from your work and activities. So I think, I think that would be it. And it doesn't, doesn't require much. Uh, I'm, all for, I'm all for big effects for tiny changes. Do you want to add it? No? Go in, uh, all right, well, hold on. Wait for the microphone. Jack? Come on, Jack. Run, Jack. Good man. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Chris Stein from the Movember Foundation. Um, thank you both. Um, you've kind of stimulated some thoughts and I'm gonna try to do as well as I can to articulate them into a question, but they're swimming at the moment. Um, David, I wanted to pick up on that point that you made about housing in particular, but it can go into any area of budgetary uh, considerations. And, and taking, um, Paul, your point about experience and mental health, and from a policy point of view, how do you extrapolate mental health, which might be embedded in housing or education or Department for Work and Pensions, and assign a funding towards mental health w when it's embedded in another budgetary consideration? Because we often hear the statistic that 1.4% of local authority budget goes to mental health, but is that accurate? And how do you disaggregate these broader issues so that you get a true social return on investment of, of public funds? I mean, the first thing to say is that, you know, we have a health budget. Um, and if you think of the size of the health budget in relation to physical health, and we have a mental health budget, minuscule, when actually when we're talking about the family of things that can happen to your mental health, there are big differences between um, um, depression, um, uh, anorexia, schizophrenia, OCD, <coughs> you might even include Alzheimer's, the range, but yet actually we just talk about mental health, so there are, there are design issues in the way that we conceive of physical and mental health. Um, but the push in relation to well-being is simply to go back to what is holistic and what is in the interests of us all. And that's why housing is a really good example. Um, we arrived in a place in Britain after the war where we had a third of people able to buy their own home and choosing to buy their own home. A third of people could socially rent, get a council place, and a third of people would rent privately. Most people moving into a new home this year in Britain are renting privately. And they're renting against a context, particularly in London and the South, of soaring rents. The middle classes tend to think about renting privately as their children, students, young graduates renting. Um, but way beyond this room, in most of London, it's families renting. I, d I hope I don't have to illustrate to this audience how stressful it is to be renting privately and potentially moving every six months because a landlord can take up the rent, kick you out, evict you, and you're moving on, you're moving on, you're moving on. My God, that is a disaster for marriages, and it's a disaster for children. Um, which is why I think we have to have some rent control, some rent cap in our country. And that's not left wing. Angela Merkel ran on that in Germany, and Bloomberg has that in New York. So it's not a left wing thing just to say, look, we cannot have this churn in that private market. And then obviously we have to build again because you cannot expect the private sector solely to be occupied with, socially, with social housing. But it's not currency at the moment for any political party to talk about council houses. Um, so if you're thinking holistically, then you get into those mental health issues. Because in the end, if you can't buy your own home, if rents are soaring, 
And if you're squeezed out of the prospect of ever having a home because there are no council, that, the mental health consequences of that are huge. And that's why we have to put, put well-being back into the starting point for policy making. The, the way I simplify this is to say, we let the economists take over everything. They you know, in a university, that was the most important department. They were the most important. We need to bring the anthropologists, the sociologists. Um, we need to bring all the other traditions back in. Because if you just leave it to the economists, you end up in the mess we're in. Thank you very much. Um, We've run out of time, I'm afraid, from what is obviously a very stimulating discussion. Um, Ryan's going to come up and explain what's happening for the rest of the day in a minute or two, but let's let our two speakers go, because I know they both have, have to be out of here quite quickly, and also let's thank them in the conventional way. Thank you very much. <laughs>